Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the AI and privacy job market trends, tech, and opportunities. My name is Jared Casalia. I am the CEO and founder of True Staffing Partners, and I am joined here with the amazing, uh, the infamous Rhonda Jesus, who is the Field Chief Privacy Officer for Transcend. We are coming together. Ron, say hello to everybody who's slowly joining us and coming into the room now. Hey everyone from New York, uh, happy to be here. And uh, let's dive into this report, Jared. Yeah, we've got a ton of information to cover today, a ton of data. A lot of the data comes from us here at True. As many of you know, we at True Staffing Partners have been tracking the behavior of the job market uh, for years now. We put out our 2024 Data Privacy Jobs Report, an instrumental resource for hiring managers who are looking for additional data on how the market behaves in order to get budget, to get buy-in, to get salary increases. Uh, it's a great resource for job seekers. And now we're starting to collect information uh, and gather data on, on what's happening with AI and AI governance. I know that's sort of the talk of the town and certainly <laughs> the privacy community. Um, there's a lot happening with professionals in privacy involving their uh, time, effort, energy, skills to uh, AI governance initiatives. And so we're going to start really high level um, with what's happening broadly at corporations with AI. And we're going to start really at data that's not ours. I always like to start with, you know, some data that's not mine to kind of set the stage, Ron, as as, as you know. Uh, this is from the IAPP e &Y report, and this shows you a little bit of like, what are companies using AI to do? Um, it's pretty disparate, although we see a lot of it is around data and analysis and process automation. Ron, I'm curious if you have any like perspectives or opinion broadly on what are we seeing people use AI for? And, you know, we'll talk a little bit throughout this hour about how that's going to lead us towards job creation. Yeah, it's funny because I think what's top of mind for privacy pros and I think the compliance industry in general is like we're all kind of scared and apprehensive about frontier AI uses. So, you know, the kind of super intelligent robots and all that, you know, stuff that's coming down the pipe. But from a actual implementation perspective, I see... I would say quite primitive uses of AI currently, like whether it be implementation of an LLM or a third party tool that touts to use AI in some capacity, for example, data discovery, or, you know, just, um, you know, again, these, these kind of more basic uses of AI that have been around for a while that have just been kind of spun with uh, the marketing AI kind of um, lens. So from a, Implementation perspective, I think across the board, it truly is your basic LLM, something that supports an existing process and nothing too technical um, at this point. And I think people are, are still waiting to see um, what tools are out there that would provide those kind of more advanced benefits. But I'm not sure if that's also what you're seeing as well in the market. Yeah, but, I, I think yeah. that's right. And I think also, you know, we talked about this before when we were last together, there's this sort of renaissance happening in software right now where mm -hmm. there's lots of startups, there's lots of established brands that are now adapting their technology or rebranding their technology. We just saw uh, Concilio in the e-discovery space today announce their new Gen I guidance, you know, for e-discovery in uh, document review process. Right. We're very careful about how they branded it in terms of this is not, you know, a non-human guided process. This is a proprietary LLM, just like you described, that we've created that we can use to help create some efficiencies. But there are people wielding these repositories, wielding this technology and guiding it. And I think the value proposition is in the guide part, right? Not the Absolutely. how do they actually execute on prompting, but, but rather guiding the client towards um, you know, integration in a smart and thoughtful way. Absolutely. Cool. Let's go to the next slide. And by the way, we're happy to take questions from anybody throughout this entire webinar. I see people are still trickling in. That's awesome. If you've got questions, pop them up in the Q&A section, not the chat, the Q&A. We're keeping our eyes on that. We'll try to answer your questions. Ron, this is, you know, um, really just showing growth of the market for AI governance over the next eight years. And we can see that it's a pretty, you know, staggered, healthy, uh, you know, evenly, you know, uh, diagonal growth chart here. Uh, I I'm a little more skeptical 
uh, personally. I think we're going to see a little less and then maybe an inflection point in a bell curve somewhere in maybe 26, 27, 28. Um, but I'm curious to see if you think adoption is going to be this sort of linear in terms of how quickly everyone grows as it relates to AI governance. Yeah, it's funny. I, I wonder if this was Claude derived, you know, in terms of yeah. the graphic, but I agree. I, I'm a, I, I am bullish on on some aspects of AI governance, but I, I, I still think it. everyone is still trying to figure out what AI governance truly entails. Um, I think from a privacy professional standpoint, obviously, we this is not our first rodeo, right? We have been doing compliance with respect to any type of emerging technology for as long as our careers. So I think we're just simply riding the wave of, of what this truly means to us. But I think in terms of, if, like, if we're saying market size in terms of, and just to be clear here, um, Jared, is this market size in terms of AI governance tooling? Can you uh, give some kind of um, color on? Software, on services, yeah. you know, this is from Fortune, right? And them going yeah. out and saying, what are, what are companies gonna be spending? Whether it's human mm. capital, whether it's, uh, third-party outsourcing, whether it's internal, um, you know, what, what are, what is, what is that going to be? Um, yeah. And, and I think there's going to be a little resistance over the next few years to deep financial investment that looks this linear of a growth trajectory, because what we're seeing, and we're going to unpack this a little bit when we talk about role definition, is there's a lot more people being asked to do AI, AI governance-related responsibilities within their business. Mm -hmm that already work in the business, then there are jobs available for people to go do exclusively an AI governance job opportunity. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Like when you look at, I think we ran an analysis, when you look at just on LinkedIn, the way people are self-branding, right? And who says they hold a job responsibility that involves AI? I think we were able, it, you know, within somewhat of a legal context, I think we were able to come up with something like 45,000. But when you actually looked at jobs posted that are exclusive to AI governance, I mean, it was like 9,000 jobs, maybe less. And, and yeah. so there's a real variance, right, of who's doing it versus who's hiring for it. It's funny that you use the term renaissance, because I also think that as privacy professionals, we're, we're going through a renaissance of our, of our own where we're, we don't want to be left behind, right? So we're kind of tacking on. AI governance to our roles. We're seeing companies now tack on AI governance or chief AI or officer and privacy to, to their requisitions um, more and more. And, and I think that's just simply because people are really wanting to have a professional that has that broad experience. But again, tacking that on or adding AI to my role is, I, sim I think, simply... Um, uh, driven by this need to not be left behind while everyone is tackling this issue. So it, I, I see that it, it makes sense, Jared, that that uh, you're seeing those numbers in terms of like title and requisition out there. So, yeah. yeah and we're going to get into privacy and, and Ron, you know, because we prepped for this. Yeah. I've got a lot of strong opinions about oh, yeah. privacy and <laughs> branding. Yeah. Yeah. I think what we're seeing right now is exactly what you said, right? Privacy people are very mission driven. Privacy mm -hmm. people generally got attracted to this profession because they cared about the work in a way that didn't have to do with money. But when you start saying privacy and this and privacy and that, privacy and AI governance, privacy and ethics, but you're not saying privacy and more compensation, or mm -hmm. you're not saying privacy and more budget because you're doing more work now, which means you can't do the work that you had in your job description before, which means somebody else has to do it, which means they don't have the ability to do all the work that they were tasked to do. So somebody else has to do that. And that's exactly what we've seen happen over the last year in the privacy job market. There mm -hmm, aren't mm -hmm. a lot of jobs out there for chief privacy officers to move around to at the financial price point that they want. They're not hiring a lot out there for privacy and anything right now at a price point that would motivate established leaders to move. But those people are also not getting raises, <laughs> you know, significant to the amount of increase of responsibility that they've taken. And what do they have to do? They have to delegate tasks. What we've seen in privacy this year is there's so much hiring at the lower levels because those people that are in the programs are being asked to do all this AI governance stuff and they need other people to do the maintenance part of their programs. DSAR requests, managing ROPA, managing DPIAs, um, managing third-party third vendor 
uh, exploration, right? Mm -hmm. um, all these things, and they're bringing in contractors, uh, having somebody implement a third party technology or a module within that technology, having an attorney come in that can help them move into Latin America, or uh, we're moving into Europe, we need to be GDPR compliant, and we need to bring in an expert. They aren't necessarily keeping that talent on perpetually, mm -hmm. right? They're impacting the business and then phasing them out because they're running so lean. And Absolutely. I don't know how much longer that can last. I mean, we're already lean as it is. I mean, I think most of my peers are one individual shows. And to now be, quote unquote, bestowed this additional privacy and title, you know, I, I think the market is just definitely, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're tired, we're, <laughs> we're, we're resource depleted and, and, and definitely um, would love to see other, other stats on, on what you're seeing in the market. But I, you hit the nail on the head, Jared, this is something yeah. that um, is, is really just being added to our, our sets of, of responsibilities and it's, it's just not enough. So, yeah. You know. So somebody said it in the chat and they beat me to it. Thank you, Francis. I don't see legal on this graph. <laughs> ah, isn't that amazing? Uh, it's prophetic. Uh, where is legal, right? It's not on here. And, and while it might fit into the other category or maybe legal is part of some of these other industries and being used in that way, it is very clear that adoption of AI in legal is going to be far more uh, cautious than what we're seeing in a lot of these other verticals. And we're actually going to show you uh, later on uh, in the hour, a survey that was done by the ABA about how law firms outside counsel are using, not using, are interested, not interested in engaging in AI. And the results are pretty- I um, was surprised at that stat. Shocking. Yeah, I kept... yeah mm -hmm. they're, they're shocking. All right, let's go to the next one. So what we've tried to do for everyone here today is create some sort of role definition. And the metaphor I keep using, and <laughs> Ron, you'll have to bear with me because I know you've heard it once before already, is this idea that a job market is formed sort of the way that stars are formed, right? There's a black hole. That black hole has so much gravity that it starts pulling people towards it of all varying sorts of disciplines, kind of like privacy did back in the foundation of what it was as a community and a focused discipline and industry. And that's what we're seeing happen with AI. Lots of people with lots of different skills are getting sucked towards this inertia of what are these jobs? Who are these people? Who's going to take control? What are those skill sets? And they're very disparate right now. A lot of our customers come to us with these nine page job descriptions for an AI governance person, and they sort of have all of these things in them. And what we usually tell our customers are, this is a job description for three or four people, not one. Um, not everyone's going to have all these skills in this marketplace. And if they do, they're going to be very expensive, right? Because they're rare and happen to have been doing this longer than others. Here's where we start seeing some role definition, right? AI lawyers... What are AI lawyers really being asked to do that are being hired or moved into those roles, particularly focused on contract negotiation or how contract AI technology is being used to assess, review, and return work product, how data is being used to train LLMs or access to that data. Um, I saw Jason Kronk put up a great post the other day about how data is being used on LinkedIn. Very interesting. Um, uh, regulatory issues how it will be regulated, although I would say that's a smaller component than data usage and IP litigation as it relates to how people are using data for AI training models. And, and then it kind of goes from there, right? Privacy AI is different depending on how you look at it. Um, there's kind of privacy AI, but then AI for privacy. Are we talking about using AI in a privacy enhanced technology kind of way in order to do things differently? Or are we talking about governing data using AI uh, which is very different. Or are we talking about building in chatbot technology in order to engage with things in a different way? Uh, we'll kind of break all that down. But Ron, tell me wh what you think of sort of these breakdowns um, and where you're seeing maybe the most demand or conversation in the marketplace around skill set. Yeah, I think obviously uh, you hit the nail on the head here too, Jared. Like we're, we're, and again, the concept of AI governance is so new that we're still navigating what a what the ideal skill set is for someone that's privacy. And I think, obviously, as a chief privacy officer, um, we have those basic skill sets. It's funny, I was talking to folks um, when I was in Brussels who were actually developing the EU AI Act, 
And they essentially said that chief privacy officers or existing privacy leaders um, need to truly up level <laughs> expertise in order to deal with the new requirements of that act. And I was a, a little bit taken aback because I, I feel like we're essentially 90% of the way there. Of course, we need to um, you know, be further educated in the, the, the kind of the technical sides of, of uh, this new technology. But again, I think uh, if you look at kind of just baseline levels, like we, we, we have experience doing data protection impact assessments that are mirrored in terms of the impact assessments in the EU AI Act, for example. We already know to some degree the implications of you know, um, bias and ensuring that um, AI systems address concerns around um, discrimination. Those are all kind of natural compliance considerations that come with the role. But again, I in, in terms of like existing requisitions, I do see uh, HR and other professionals trying to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, into these <laughs> job descriptions. And 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 I think that's just I I I actually think that's um, just a a sign of the evolution of this role. Everyone is just you know trying to figure out who is best going to be suited to this to this position. So let me put in as much into this job description and see who hits the mark at least, you know, uh, 90% of the way there. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to distill from that kind of um, offering is that as CPOs, as privacy leaders, um, you know, I think we're still the best suited when it comes to, uh, if you're looking at the the broad kind of uh, selection of governance professionals out there, I think we, we, we still fit the mold quite, quite good, so, you know. Well, I, I think of it like who else, right? Like from a cultural exactly. perspective. Who yeah. else in the business has been asked to go and touch all the other parts of the business other than privacy mm -hmm. in a way that requires influence in order to lead to adoption as opposed to setting rules and they will be followed, right? The culture yeah. of security and the culture of security professionals, very different than the culture of privacy and privacy professionals, just both from like the ecosystem of humans that possess those positions. I, I mean, literally different, right? Like privacy, you've got 50-50 gender diversity yeah. and Cybersecurity, it's like, you know, three to four on a good day, less in leadership roles. And they manage with a different style and they have a different level of buy-in and mandate and budget from the board. So privacy people are being tasked with this because they've been successful quite often influencing the business across the business. Such, such a great point, Jared, because if you are... You know, if you are a good privacy professional, if you're a good CPO, you already have existing relationships with, with obviously legal, your CISO, your product and engineering folks. You're having those discussions since 2018 in terms of how to operationalize DSARS, data deletion, et cetera, with your marketing folks. You're presenting to the board. So why I, I think, and this is why I think executive teams look to privacy professionals and kind of you know, give us that baton and say, hey, do this now. And and it makes sense because it, it's such a great point. Like we, we've, we've established those relationships. Who else in the org is so cross-functional? So yeah, great, great point. Let's take a look at a little bit of actual job titles that we're seeing that fall into some of these buckets, um, MT. So with AI lawyers, and, and so they're not called AI lawyers. They're called this. This is where we see that job function and responsibilities once we start looking at the job description falling under, right? So your chief legal officer is being tasked with this. AGCs are being tasked with this. When they compartmentalize the regulatory aspect for AI for law firms that are sort of looking to brand themselves that way or corporations that are deeply committed to having that internal resource, they sort of self-brand. And we've kind of tried to order these um, in order of... Um, hierarchy within an ecosystem from top to bottom. We are seeing some AI lobbyist positions, right? Um, mm. I was taken aback too on your comment because I tell you what I don't see happening right now as it relates to the EU AI Act. I don't see the sort of corporate frenzy to insource talent in an effort to prepare for compliance the way I did for GDPR, mm -hmm. not even close. GDPR was a inflection point for the privacy industry in terms of both professionalization and hiring, just job creation, straight up. Uh, also, the beginning of its diversification towards just hiring full time. GDPR led to massive amounts of contract hiring, and contract hiring has been the primary way that people are hiring in 2024 in this down economy. 
So I, I'm not seeing that either, Ron. I mean, it, th that would take me back too. I'm not seeing people demand this skill set in the same way I did for GDPR, but that could change on a dime. It could very much change on a dime. Yeah, I think pre-GDPR, pre-2018, the concept of the chief privacy officer was a nice to have. You know, if, a, if an organization did have someone at the, the C-level responsible for privacy, they were prob probably pretty forward thinking. And then come 2018, May, you know, uh, GDPR hit. If you, don't, if you do not have a CPO, you're, you're kind of behind the times, right? So with the EU AI Act and with the bills coming out from, from the U.S. side, you know, I, I, I do think there's going to be an uptick, but it's going to not be specific to just you know, chief AI officer, again, I, again, I think it's going to be, and, you know, what, what is the uh, governance professional that could basically take on those extra responsibilities? Um, yeah. For now. For, For now. now. Yeah. Right? I mean, in some ways, that's how yeah. privacy started too. It was security yeah. and privacy or ethics yeah. and privacy or, hey, you're my IP lawyer. You're now going to do privacy or whatever. And, at yeah. a certain point like that, it just can't be and anymore. I think the real esoteric question, we can go to the next slide here because I think we're we're moving into, ah, yes, the products. These are some of the titles we're seeing associated on the product side, the mm -hmm. services side. A lot of the services in AI are um, strategic, consultative. Let's bring a third party in from the outside to give us a perspective maybe we don't have or to gut check, validate, check the things that we are doing. Um, we can go on to the next one, MT. So here's the privacy and slide from the IAPP that just came out in their report. It's a very interesting report. It's, uh, you know, the people behind it are brilliant. Saz and Joe are great over at the IAPP. Um, but what it doesn't get into is how compensation or budget has been affected by all of this change. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, it hasn't. <laughs> They're not getting more budget. They're not getting more headcount. And if it is, it's incremental. Nobody's mm -hmm. doubling their salaries, although some people feel like they've doubled their job responsibilities. And what will be interesting to see is, will we get to a place where the privacy and the AI are valued financially in the business the same, differently, um, and and why and how? Yeah. And we talked a little bit about this before, Jared, but I think as executive teams are still navigating the value of having maybe a, another FTE to address AI governance, we, we talked about this concept of the and part as a stopgap measure, right? As executive right. teams are, again, trying to discern whether or not AI governance truly deserves its own specialized, you know, essentially resource, they are adding this to roles without the proper resourcing and without the proper compensation because they're still trying to figure out if it warrants that. And I, 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 you know, to, to some degree that makes sense, but at the same time, if you expect us as existing CPOs to then add this, you know, uh, swath of other responsibilities to our plate, where, 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 you know, I, I think it, it, it deserves it deserves some consideration for extra compensation and resources to go and attack that problem, but, you know. I think it's coming. I think it's going to have to come because the other problem that we lie in is when the economy starts to rebound, and I think we're at the precipice of an inflection point, macroeconomically speaking, on a global level, when that inflection point begins, it's not going to be like it used to be in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, 2010s. You know, it life isn't like that anymore. Things change faster and more frequently, meaning we've watched now both the stock markets, both the job markets and the general macro economy go from the bottom in 2020 during the pandemic to the highest it's ever been in 2022, back down to the bottom again. And we are now 24 months in from the moment where the NASDAQ and the Dow crashed and Zuckerberg laid off 10,000 people and everybody thought we were going into recession and that didn't really happen. And now we're having the soft landing. And this afternoon, the feds are going to lower interest rates for the first time in four years. And that is going to trigger the pendulum swinging with momentum in favor of job seekers instead of employers, which is where it's been for the last 24 months. Employers have to prepare for that. And because they've run so lean for the last 24 months, 
the frenzy to acquire talent that has these skill sets that's been ramping up over the last two years, adapting, reinventing, will be frenetic. And there aren't going to be bevies of people available that have these skill sets when the frenzy begins. So they're going to command a lot of stuff. That's my assumption, right? That's what happened in yeah. privacy. That's the story of GDPR. That's the story of 21 and 22. That's the story we see happening in 25 and 26. Yeah. And I know we'll get into this later on, Jared, but as as this kind of need for professionals who have the skill set, we'll also see an, an, a giant uptick in the number of maybe AI related certs. We're seeing this with the IAPP and you know the the need for folks. I think there's a question already on like what what training exists and what certifications exist for AI specifically, given it's such a new um, you know uh, area of expertise. So um, excited to talk about that a little later on too. Hundred percent. All right. Yeah. Let's see what's next. Chief privacy officers and AI, and we've alluded to some of what we're going to talk about here, but let's do a deep dive. Uh, this is by the numbers. So in 2024, less than 2% of jobs that we've seen advertised, and we track them all, have been for chief privacy officers. That's the lowest that number has been since we've started tracking this data, probably around 2015, 16. Uh, 10 to 20% of CPOs in the Fortune 1000 said that they spend 10 to 20% of their time recruiting on their own because they haven't been given external resources. And that takes a lot more time to talk to a lot more people. And then they lose people along the way. But maybe the biggest impact of their time spent has been 15 to 25% spent on AI or AI governance. And um, that number was the same in 2023. It's been the same now in 2024, roughly around 20%, if you want to even it out. Ron, I'm curious if you're hearing the same thing out there from chief privacy officers uh, and, and what they're saying about this uh, loss of time. Yeah, and I absolutely, I think 99% of my peers, other chief privacy officers, other leaders have said that they have been addressing to some degree AI governance. Um, again, still navigating what that is, but I, I, you're absolutely right. They're, 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 they're currently time crunched and, and their resources are spent on doing the existing DPIAs, vendor reviews, addressing DSARs. And now on top of this, we have to go and find you know, potentially, you know, consultants that can help with understanding how to build an AI governance program, how to vendors that purport to provide, you know, AI governance tooling. So yes, our time is now, you know, dedicated to to do that extra task of understanding and navigating what we need to set up and and up level our existing privacy compliance programs to address AI. So yes, uh, already strapped. <laughs> Yeah, and we've got a question here from Michael. I'll, I'll read it out loud. I'll let you uh, answer first and then and, and I'll piggyback. Do you yeah. believe that privacy experience paired with the AI GP cert is a viable path to potentially break into that AI related governance work you're fo forecasting without actually having concrete experience working with AI? That's a really, really good question. And I honestly think that um, it's the same with every cert, if I'm being honest with you. Like if you are just breaking into the privacy profession and you might be, you know, um, trying to understand which CIPP uh, cert that you, you know, whether it's the US or the CIPM or CIPT, these are all good things to demonstrate a baseline knowledge of privacy operations or technology, et cetera. It's the same with the current AIGP. Um, because it's such a new field, I think that the process of studying for it, of getting the training, will give you an upper hand when it comes to understanding how to apply these principles to your current, you know, privacy government uh, governance uh, uh, activities and operations. So I wouldn't say that it's necessarily some. I, I do hope that the curriculum evolves with 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 how AI evolves, but I, I do think that getting a certification does at least demonstrate to some degree that you have an understanding of the general concepts of AI and how to apply that to the protection of personal data in your current day-to-day -day as a privacy professional. Again, not something, I have the AIGP, for example, but I, I definitely wouldn't say that I'm a top AI expert as many people do on LinkedIn. So, uh, uh, and I'm still learning. And, and I do hope that there's a couple of other certs out there. I think ISACA has one. 
Um, you know, I think a couple of other kind of standard bodies provide AI certs, but I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly looking at more of the AI tech um, expertise and, and community to uplevel my 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 knowledge of that. And a, but again, from a privacy governance perspective, I'm then layering on top. Okay, the principles of transparency, of of security, of all these things that we already know, and applying that to kind of the, the, the more AI tech uh, foundational elements that I'm, I'm starting to learn more about. So again, long, long answer to your question is, I think it's just a good um, uh, way to demonstrate baseline comprehension of AI concepts. So it, it, I agree with everything you said, Ron. Oh. Uh, you know, Michael, I'll hit you with a truism, which is employers tend to invest in people who invest in themselves. Mm -hmm. And so getting the certification is an investment in yourself. It's an investment in your career. You know, I, I'm by no means a, an AI expert, but when you take these certifications, it helps empower you to talk to other people who really are experts in the space about what they do with a level of intelligence that they feel like they can open up to you or they feel like they could offer you a job because you can engage with them in an enriched way. So even if it's just giving you vernacular or vocabulary or yeah. things that um, enable you to engage with more sophisticated people, um, it's probably a good use of your time. And I will say this, we definitely don't see employers saying you have to have an AI GP in order to get this role, but- Not yet, have, not yet. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> but we do have employers that say that about other uh, IAPB certifications, right? Or about yeah. other technology certifications. So yeah. There's a couple of requisitions out there, sorry to interrupt, Jared, I, that I've seen where CIPMs or CIPPUSs have gone from a preferred requirement to at least one CIPP cert. So yeah. yes, absolutely right. And I like the the way you frame that, Jared, in terms of having an AIGP certifi certification, at least being an indicator that you're investing in learning more about this field. Um, that, that was a great way of putting it. Um, because again, I think as, as we start to see more positions around there, why not have a leg up and have that kind of cert demonstrate your interest in, in this burgeoning field, so. Yeah. MT. Let's see what we got next on deck. Uh, this is probably the slide everybody's been waiting for, and it allows us to really look. Now, look, uh, on the far left side, these aren't actual titles. We kind of showed you some of what the titles are in those previous slides. Um, th this is more just to give you leveling. So we've given sort of generic titles here, uh, executive being CPO level and, you know, analyst being more than entry level. We'll call it early career and then everything in between. What's really important here is that you can see just how wide these ranges are. Uh, let's talk about executives on one hand. Some of these executive level roles, like you know, chief AI governance officer, can be as low as 133,000. That was the lowest that we found. The highest we found is half a mil. What's important here is sort of what's in the middle. Um, and, and and I'll cue you in one second, MT, not yet. Um, Let's look at some of the other jobs, right? On the low end, analyst 60, specialist 63. On the high end, 151, 220. This is a massive range. How can one job at one company that looks and feels the same as another job at another company have such wild compensations? And I think it really speaks to what Ron said before. A lot of hiring managers and employers are using this process to figure out what they actually need, which is why some of these job descriptions seem like a catch-all for the black hole where it's, they're asking for the world, but they don't actually expect to hire the world. They're trying to figure out who has what skill sets, what does it cost? This role could pay 60, it could pay 150. Well, this role could pay 76, it could pay 325. Here's the analysis that I think is most important that we all take away from this as privacy professionals picking up governance. Hit it, MT. It's such a subtle animation, but it says so much. The median that we're seeing in the marketplace leans far more towards the minimum than it does the maximum. And this is the problem with AI governance as a burgeoning industry community siloed away from being privacy and or security and or whatever and AI governance. They're not paying enough money for these jobs for anyone to leave behind what they've done and do this exclusively because the medians of these salaries are so far from the ceilings. It, it just doesn't add up and work out. 
So look, I'm not suggesting that CPOs should be doubling their salaries by taking on these responsibilities, but I think we have to examine, will they be valued more as an AI governance professional and leave behind privacy, or will that not transpire if not right away for a little while longer? And then how do they get buy-in and value to manage both groups before the business can see the return of that value and invest further into headcount and talent, which will likely be very reactionary to how other businesses and like businesses do, right? Like if Google does one thing, Facebook, Meta does it, and then there's a chain reaction, right? Will that be the way to go, Ron? I've talked too much. Tell me what you think about all this salary data. Yeah. No, I agree that that animation is so impactful because, you know, as you, it's a good question because I wonder if the exec teams and the hiring managers that are hiring for privacy and roles, if they're also just biding their time to see who's going to bite at these requisitions, if they're going to offer them at the current or, you know, market value, quote unquote, um, compensation packages. So it's it, it's it's really uh, it's such a good question because I'm not sure. Like for example, the the lead who at the max level is 325. Maybe they have some sort of engineering background. You know, I wonder what what specific backgrounds these folks have in the max categories that are you know that the the you know the, the Facebooks and the and the and the Googles are are kind of throwing these outrageous not outrageous but high salaries at them. So. I think it, it it truly depends on 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 their backgrounds, obviously. But I'm 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 I and I'm excited to see how this evolves and to see if this the quote unquote bubble bursts with respect to these roles. Um, but yeah, such an interesting um, figure because you would assume that we would at least get a requisite percentage more <laughs> as right. CPOs. But yeah, right, or, or at least you know. that these medians would be in the middle of the mins and the yeah. Mind. But they're not. Mm -hmm. They lean much more towards the minimum. And I think it's because people are doing a lot of exploring and they're figuring out what they want and they don't know until they see it. And a lot of times I think in this economy, I've seen more clients settle for getting either a lower caliber or a less skilled professional that they intend to ramp as opposed to spending extra cash capital in base compensation to right. get somebody that comes quite skilled. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think that will be the market we're in in six months. I think it'll be a complete 180 of that probably in six months, maybe a little longer for AI governance, but not longer for privacy pros. Because what's happening now is the market is slowly running out of contract resources because everyone's using contractors right now. They're going to have to start hiring full-time people with more veracity. And there's going to be more opportunity, more turnover, and that's going to create a job market that moves up in terms of how people are being compensated. Yeah. Or they may just start to rely on chat GPT a lot more. <laughs> well, you you know, I, I won't share the story I have, but you know, it, it chat I GPT love that story, by the way. <laughs> it's going to take up hours. If we have time at the end, I'll tell it to everybody. But yeah. you know, I, I've got practical stories that people are telling me about, you know, using chat GPT to replace the billable hour for attorneys. So let's talk about that. It's a great segue into this category, outside counsel and AI. And this is the survey by the ABA that Ron and I were talking about earlier. And I just find it astonishing. The baby blue line is uh, firms that have been identified as using or considering using AI. And the darker blue line is either not interested, don't know, don't care, not going to use AI. When you look at really the far right side of this chart where attorney firms, which is you know most of the AMLAW 200 at 100 to 500 or 500 plus attorneys and 83% survey partners and associates said they're not interested or don't know anything about AI. I mean, I find that really astonishing. Um, and and, uh, and I, I don't know how much longer, like that's a really viable course. What we're seeing on the law firms that are in this 36%, particularly at 500 plus is they're bringing in talent now to help them not just create operational efficiency using AI, but how to rethink how they structure their pricing, how they rethink how they bill customers because they're either getting downward pressure from their corporate customers to do things, build things differently using smart technology, or we'll go find other law firms that can do that for us. Mm -hmm. Or they're realizing they can build premiums for services related to AI legal intelligence and expertise that is rarer and hard to come by in this marketplace for now. And that's sort of where the forward thinking 
firms are starting to uh, create application of use cases. Ron, what do you think of all this data? What are you seeing happen at Outside Council? Firstly, I think it's astonishing as well <laughs> that law firms aren't jumping on the bandwagon. It's like, do they know something that we don't know in terms of just like, you know, forecasting what the, what the market's going to expect? I think, again, even from an outside counsel perspective, I think there's also this apprehension that if they do start to use AI tooling to support their legal services, that, um, you know, that could affect their rates, right? And it could, I, we've also seen, you know, stories in the, in the media around, you know, uh, certain lawyers using chat GPT tooling and, and the outputs citing non-existent case law. So I think there's, there's still, you know, I, I still think law firms themselves are navigating A, you know, how to properly integrate and operationalize AI tooling to support their work. Um, and then B, you know, how does that affect uh, their bottom line and, and the expertise that they tout to have around, you know, uh, why are we essentially engaging a partner at $700 per hour when we can use Claude to come up with something that's potentially 90% of the way there, right? So I, I definitely think that's something that um, they're still navigating. And, and, um, but I think there's still opportunity uh, uh, for, for the specialized skill set um, um, from, a, from a legal perspective. But yeah. super interesting stats, yeah. I'll, I'll take it a step further. You know, how do we price the use of Claude if we're licensing it as outside counsel and doing business services in addition yeah. to legal work? Uh, and what does that look like? And is it billable hours and machine time? I mean, it reminds me of e-discovery when we when I first got into space in the late 90s, early 2000s, and people were like we're charging fifteen hundred dollars, two grand to process a gigabyte of data. Right? Think about that for a second. You know, <laughs> I, I remember the Siemens litigation when it went on in Europe, and you had to go and both now collect and process data locally in Germany. And I mean, people were spending you know billions, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on all sorts of work as it related to discovery. We've gotten a lot cheaper and a lot better at it. But AI sort of is at this, as we said, renaissance moment in terms of adoption, utilization, pricing, it's all sort of the wild, wild west. There's mm -hmm. lots of opportunity to compete against traditional models. And there's a lot of opportunity for traditional models to change and elevate both in terms of value proposition on an hourly rate on pure dollars and cents, but also decreased billings for greater efficiencies. What right. law firms are hopefully trying to figure out is how do we configure this to make more money and run more efficiently? Exactly. And, and it may mean less people, but it may mean more people at a higher rate. It just depends on how you're going to slice and dice it. But that's what seems to be being figured out right now. Another pathway could be if, you know, a, a law firm purports to have a proprietary, you know, proprietarily trained GPT that's specific to a specific type of, you know, um, legal vertical, for example, that could totally. be a pathway. But um, I'm excited to see what they come up with. Yeah, I think we're going to yeah. see that. We've built an LLM that's very specific towards, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical litigation, exactly. of nature, and, you know, you we've got, you know, data permission usage to run all of this through our LLM, and you're going to yeah. benefit from us by doing that, and that'll save you hours. You might pay another $200 an hour for the attorney that does this work, but you're going to save all this money in this other way. And uh, th yeah, that's what I see happening. Really fascinating. Yeah. All right. What's needed right now at law firms? Education, evangelism, and then adoption. Uh, and that's what I think will get us more to that straight line horizontal growth for AI and AI governance, uh, rather than more of what I think will happen, which is sort of a bell curve inflection point moment. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's look at AI job titles by category for law firms. Uh, what we're seeing mostly at law firms is, <coughs> excuse me, Whoever is in charge of AI for the firm is the committee chair. And most law firms like to rule by committee. And most law firms that are getting involved in these conversations create committees. So if you're at a law firm and they don't have a committee, maybe you should start one. Maybe you should be the chair. That may be a voluntary job to start, but it puts you in a real position of both visibility and authority when it comes to AI. Most of the AMLA 200 sort of have this formulated, but it's never too late to volunteer to be part of the committee, right? Uh, we are seeing partners and senior associates in AI, the chief innovation officer, some CAIO, although those are rare. 
Um, you know, recently Kirkland and Ellis hired one. We've seen a few others, um, but mostly the CINA or the chief innovation officer tends to be the person they're leaning on to do the diligence and help guide decisions for the firm and be part of the AI committee. Uh, then we kind of trickle down the, you know, uh, hierarchy to get more tactical jobs. Uh, certainly when we start getting into like a practice technology advisor, when it comes to AI, this may involve people, and this is for corporations too, but largely at law firms, uh, we need help with Copilot, right? Lawyers are using Copilot. That's considered AI. That falls under this advisory of how we use technology to better our daily lives. Uh, things like Harvey, um, you know, uh, things like HiQ, uh, things like Kira, right? With contract analysis, that tends to be an area where operational non-practicing attorneys are leveraging and using AI. So these are sort of the trends we're seeing here. Ron, any any additional comments on on this outside counsel world? No, I, I think the the um, obviously the trend to add AI to a practice area, whether again it's um, you know AI that's specific to retail or you know some other industry, I think that's just part of the trending that we're seeing industry wide right if you, if you, if you're not if you're a law firm that is going to be purporting to specialize in um, AI compliance and governance we're going to need to have titles that are kind of you know reflective of that so all makes sense to me yeah MT let's get into privacy technology and AI and and Ron I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little Q&A for you yeah. Uh, because I don't know the answers to all these questions. I have some ideas, but I know you're very close to this. What are privacy leaders, CPOs, general counsel, what are they looking for from privacy software companies as it relates to AI? What do they expect their technologies to do or address? What are you hearing out there? Yeah, and this is not necessarily new or groundbreaking, but I still think that there's a need um, and a desire for tooling that is, quote unquote, just baseline automated, like, you know, that that just does your basic data discovery, inventorying, et cetera, in a way that is automated, but also integrates with the current suite of tooling. I'll give you an example at Transcend. Obviously, we have, you know, um, tooling that, you know, we can identify where your data is across your inventories, unstructured, structured, et cetera. But all of that also integrates with our assessment modules, with our data maps with all of our kind of proprietary tooling. So I think baseline, people are expecting automation. Again, it's not exactly AI driven, but again, it's it's something that is table stakes for us. And I think a lot of folks are also wanting templates that are specific to the assessments that are being required by things like the EU AI Act. We want, um, you know, uh, uh, fundamental rights impact assessments template to, to be conducting on our AI technologies. We want to be able to uh, overlay our existing BPIAs with the requirements of emerging, you know, whether it's the Colorado or the Utah acts. So having that library, I think of, 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 of templates to help us do our jobs when it comes to AI governance is definitely critical. And then also one thing that I'm, that I'm seeing folks ask for is, hey, we're implementing an LLM, uh, can you help me better understand how to essentially make sure that the data that my employees are putting out there uh, into these LLMs is compliant with GDPR, CCPA, et cetera. So tooling that will help inputs to ensure that outputs are also cognizant of, of their privacy obligations. So I think those three buckets are, are, are what I'm seeing. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, yep. You know. It, it, because it sort of helps with that dichotomy of like, well, is this privacy AI or AI for privacy, right? And this right. feels like more, you know, and really a little bit of both, right? We're preparing for compliance as it relates to AI, but we're also, how do we make sure all of our technology is talking to each other the right way? So absolutely, uh, all of our data is consistent and discoverable and, you know, we're not having to do things more than once that can be done through automation. But I guess, is, is it really AI then becomes... Often the question is it a you know uh, is it important that they brand it that way uh, or or is it just an easier to sell that way sometimes I think is what a lot of people wonder right I think what I'm seeing tooling uh, you know obviously a lot of tooling right now is automated and it's being rebranded as AI powered you yeah. know AI supported uh, and again it's just basically you know algorithm 
algorithmic operationalization of these existing yeah. privacy operations. So anyway, yeah. MT, is AI always needed? Can automations exist? On it? Well, we covered this one. Uh, and I think we covered some great use cases too. Let's go to the third question. Ah, the chatbot-like communication. So mm -hmm. are you seeing downward interest from uh, corporate stakeholders wanting to interact with privacy technology in a verbal or prompt-oriented kind of way? And how essential will that level of chatbot communication be to in, you know, enhance the privacy program experience? Absolutely. I mentioned this at the beginning of the webinar, Jared, 99% of the use cases I'm seeing are integrations and implementations of a company's own LLM, right? And again, as I just mentioned, a lot of, at least from a privacy governance perspective, we're seeing CPOs concerned with the data that's going into these LLMs, whether it be by their customers or by their internal employees. So yes, I think that again, as a, as a basic kind of implementation of AI, it is the chat bots, it is the, um, you know, LLMs that are going to support employees to do their jobs better. But again, from a governance perspective, we're, we're more, you know, um, focused on the data that's going in there uh, to make sure that it's compliant with our existing obligations around GDPR, CCPA, et cetera. So. We've got a couple of questions. I want to take a quick second for a few questions. We've got about nine minutes left on our hour. So uh, we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll go into the takeaways, MT. Uh, what skills and knowledge do you recommend law students gain to best be prepared for an AI governance related role when they graduate? Mm. What, do you, what do you think the entry level early career professionals should do first, Ron? Yeah, and, and I go back to my comment around kind of uh, the existing suite of certifications and training around privacy governance, right? I know this, this question is specific to AI governance, but I think the foundational knowledge on the existing historical frameworks around transparency, choice, you know, um, all those good things that we know and hold dear to our heart as privacy professionals are definitely uh, good pathways to better understanding AI governance. And then once you have that, kind of foundational privacy governance, you know, background, get into the more technical aspects of, of, of AI governance. And I we mentioned that, you know, obviously IAPP has their AIGP, but I see some other governing bodies like, like ISACA. Um, I believe that, um, I think NIST might have something, some training around AI as well, but then leading into, you know, up-leveling and layering on top of your governance background, uh, those more, AI specific, um, you know, curriculum. So, so again, I think coming out of college, focused on on again the skill sets and the resources out there as privacy professionals, and then veer into AI. That that would be my recommendation. So, I, I agree, and we've got another yeah. question that kind of ties into this. Uh, I'll let you kick it off, and I'll piggyback. With some yeah. experience in AI as a privacy person, how do you recommend representing this fairly on a resume? Ah, <laughs> so again, I, I again, it's 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 uh, focusing your existing es expertise on the ability to stand up general compliance programs. Again, um, if you are a privacy professional and you built a privacy program that might be based on generally accepted privacy principles, on whatever framework it might be that's GDPR driven, or you know. Uh, whatever legislation you might be working with, focus on the fact that you have the experience building baseline compliance programs. And then, you know, uh, talk a little bit about how you might be interested in AI governance and this burgeoning field. So again, uh, I, I know I, I sound like a broken record, but focusing on your table stakes kind of compliance experience um, is, is, something that I would kind of uh, look to when I'm, when I'm, when I would be reviewing uh, re resumes for a requisition. So. Yeah, I agree yeah. with all that, Ron. And I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give maybe a, a different perspective. That's a little more um, tactical, which is we encourage people at true to think of 
listing skill sets, particularly with AI in a couple of ways, one of which kind of goes back to that previous slide of uh, evangelism, uh, well, education, evangelism, adoption, right? And, and you, thinking of those verbs as, well, what have I done to educate people about AI in the business? How have I evangelized it? Mm. And then did I get any adoption and where? And structuring your narratives around those sort of frameworks sometimes helps articulate success on a resume. Another way to think about it is um, efforts, impacts, and outcomes. What was the effort I put into whatever this AI agenda was, even if it was just getting educated, right? What was the impact it made on the business and what was the ultimate outcome uh, of that impact? Um, meaning, hey, we were able to uh, get, in, get data to marketing faster as a result of using this AI overlay technology, which enabled them to communicate with customers, which helped drive revenue up in the fourth quarter in a more meaningful way than perhaps it could have if you know we didn't have that capability. I'm just making stuff up now. But anywhere you can draw you know, metrics and analysis and business impact related to your effort, even if it's just you know, at a law firm, hey, I got a partner to actually take a call with a third party vendor who has AI technology that might benefit the firm. And it was the first time that partner had ever explored potentially uh, investing in the firm, uh, integrating enterprise AI technology. I mean, that's a huge win, right? Um, and and that's I love that example, Jared, the, the tangible use case, you know, uh, as simple as, hey, I reviewed a vendor that product wanted to implement into the organization that was AI powered I conducted a data protection impact assessment on this initiative that um, was, you know, AI adjacent. So again, yeah, hitting on the, those specific use cases um, in your resume, I definitely helpful. Yeah. You know, Great. And really again, important. privacy for AI or AI for privacy. You could say, hey, uh, we we did an assessment, a privacy impact assessment on a new AI technology that has nothing to do with privacy, but it will be privacy compliant with our business right. as a result. And now you're you you know you're talking about it. All right, let's quickly go over our takeaways from this last hour. We've got three minutes left um, and any questions we didn't get to, I'll try to answer them independently to everybody later. Uh, we appreciate everybody's questions and attendance. The advice and guidance here is level up your skills now. You might be leveling up your job later uh, as the market catches up. Be an influencer, right? If you can influence people in your organization to start caring about AI, start exploring it, begin with education. That leads to evangelism. And then finally, adoption. And remember, these things come in the, those orders. Do lots of demos. Talk to vendors. Let them in the door. Explore them. They have you know, all sorts of resources you may not. CPOs, be patient, but be prepared. There is going to be a resurgence of demand for people with your skill sets. The market just doesn't know what it needs yet. Uh, measure success with metrics. I think this is, speaks to the resume guidance we just gave, right? Anything that drives business outcomes. I know we've talked a lot about compliance, but compliance isn't the only way to show outcomes, right? They could have business impacts that uh, are related to compliance, but go above and beyond that and look for those opportunities, even if it's small victories. Uh, a small victory on a resume can lead to a huge win on an interview, right? Um, if you haven't had that raise, but you have leveled up, I empower you out there, AI governance, privacy community to ask for that raise. We're coming to the end of the year. If your responsibilities have increased disproportionately to your salary, have the courage to ask for a raise. You'd be surprised if you don't ask, you don't get. And if you ask for a raise, you will feel better about the work that you do than if you don't. I'm telling you right now, employers are not going to be wildly generous at the end of this year because they care and love about their employees all so much. They're going to be tight on the purse strings. And sometimes the difference between someone who gets a raise or a bonus is because someone asked for one. Ron, final thoughts? Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize and reiter reiterate that we are all struggling and navigating through what AI governance means to us, all of us, you know, everyone that I've talked to in my six months as field chief privacy officer at Transcend has emphasized that they have been tasked with AI governance and are still unclear and navigating this on their own. So I would say, again, and even personally myself, I've been just, you know, independently up leveling my expertise in this field by 
taking free courses, by doing as much independent research on, on you know, how to, again, overlay existing privacy thought leadership and concepts to AI. Um, there's a couple of free courses out there. I took a, recently took a one on IBM, uh, has a fundamentals, um, AI fundamentals course. Again, do take the initiative to do that. And again, there are some other, other resources like we had mentioned, the IPP, AIGP, which again, to your point, Jared, truly demonstrate that you are at least signaling to the market your interest in this field and that you're doing something to, to, to essentially you know, um, um, up-level your expertise, but then also uh, make you stand out from the, 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 the swath of other CPOs that might have existing privacy knowledge. So, so again, you take the initiative to, to up-level uh, and um, yeah, that, that would be my kind of parting words. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining yeah. us. You can connect with Ron and I. Please connect with us on LinkedIn. We want to hear from you directly. Anybody that reaches out to me will get a response. Uh, I'm sure the same is true of Ron. We want to hear from you. We want to engage with you. Join us again in another three months. We're going to yeah. come back for the next year, at least, if not more, every three months. Right, Ron? Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. And if anyone's going to the IPP Privacy Security and Risk Conference in LA next week, both Jared and I will be there. Uh, so come say hi. 100%. Can't wait. Yeah. We'll see everybody there and see you again in three months. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.